Hi everyone, this is part two of chapter one of physics for the MCAT. Chapter 1.5 covers Newton's laws, and there are actually three laws that Newton stated. The first is that when an object is at rest, it must have a net force of zero. And the way to write this in an equation is that the net force equals zero, which also equals mass times acceleration. I condensed these both into one law because the second law states that the net force equals mass times acceleration. And both force and mass has an arrow over it because it is a vector, which means that the net force will be applied in the same direction as the direction of acceleration. The third law is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if something called A applies a force onto something called B, this will also cause an equal and opposite reaction force on B that is caused by A. What this means is that let's say you're driving a really heavy truck and this truck hits a fly. So the truck hitting the fly would apply a certain amount of force on the fly, causing maybe not so great things to the fly, but the fly would also apply an equal amount of force to the truck. But the truck doesn't feel this force as much because the truck has greater mass, which means the truck will experience less acceleration as a result of the impact with the fly. However, because the fly has very low mass, the fly would experience a lot of acceleration, and this would cause a lot of damage to this fly. Chapter 1.6 is about motion with constant acceleration, which is most commonly calculated with the equations of linear motion, which are colloquially called the kinematic equations. So you might have seen these in your physics classes, and it's very helpful to memorize them, but I think some of them are very intuitively easy to understand and don't necessarily need explicit memorization. So for example, equation one says that the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. So acceleration multiplied by time is basically change in velocity because if you change velocity for a certain amount of time, that is equal to the total change in velocity. And it seems natural that the change in velocity plus the initial velocity is equal to the end velocity. The second equation is worth memorizing in my opinion because the displacement is equal to the initial velocity times time. So this is what the displacement would be if there was no acceleration plus acceleration multiplied by time squared over 2. So to me, this term is not very intuitively understandable, so I would memorize this equation. The third says that the final velocity squared equals the initial velocity squared plus 2 times acceleration times displacement. I would memorize this as well. The fourth equation says that displacement equals the average velocity times time, and this one to me is very intuitively understandable because velocity times time would equal displacement. So what's important about these kinematic equations and why there are four of them to describe the same linear motion is that each of them has a particular variable missing. So the first one has displacement missing, which means that if you were trying to calculate one of the variables that are here, but you don't know what the displacement is, and you don't really care what the displacement is, you would use the first equation. The second has the final velocity missing. So if you only have acceleration, um, the initial velocity, and you want to know the displacement, and you don't really care about what the final velocity is, you would use the second equation. And the third is true for time, and the fourth is true for acceleration. So the concept of air resistance is that it increases as speed increases. So if you drop something from a very heavy building, it will experience more air resistance as its speed increases. And eventually, this air resistance would equal the force of gravity if it goes fast enough. And when the air resistance equals the force of gravity, this object stops gaining speed, which means it reaches terminal velocity. This doesn't cause the object to stop because when the when all the forces cancel out, this just means there is no more acceleration. However, the speed can still continue at a very, very high speed. Projectile motion is different from linear motion because projectile motion needs both an x component and a y component.
So for example, if you threw a baseball up in the air and forward, it would follow this trajectory of first going up and then moving back down. So projectile motion has both an X component and a Y component. When you first throw the ball, this ball has a velocity going up and forward. And this can be separated into the velocity going forward as well as the velocity going up. The velocity going up would decrease by 9.8 meters per second because this is being affected by gravity. However, the horizontal or the going forward velocity would be constant because gravity doesn't affect how fast things move forward. And so in order to calculate what happens in projectile motion, you need to use trigonometry. So the velocity in the x direction is the total velocity times cosine theta, and the velocity in the y direction is the velocity times sine theta. And in order to calculate what happens as this object moves forward, you would use the y velocity in the kinematic equations described um, in the previous slide with the acceleration as negative 9.8 meters per second. The velocity in the x direction will never change. And once you know the velocity in the y component and the velocity in the x component, you can put it back together using ways we described in the last episode to find the total velocity. A question that might arise is, what would happen if an object was on an inclined plane? So here I've drawn a 10 kilogram block on an inclined plane, and the force that is parallel to this plane would equal mg sine theta. So this is the force that would go this way or that way. And theta in this case is the angle between the force and the vector of gravitational force. So the force perpendicular to this plane, which is the force going this way or the force going this way. Remember that the force going up that is perpendicular to the plane is the normal force. So this would be equal to mg cosine theta, which is the exact same equation that we used in order to calculate normal force. And this makes sense because if this object is not moving, then this object must have a net force of zero. And we know from normal forces that this object has a normal force of mg cosine theta in this direction. And we also know that cosine theta changes sine depending on whether theta is greater than 90 degrees or less than. So these two forces would cancel out exactly because they would be the same in magnitude, but they would have opposite signs. Another type of motion is circular motion. So in circular motion, you have an object moving in a circle at constant speed, and it's moving around a certain central point with a certain radius. So this object has only one force that's acting on it if it's moving at a constant speed, and this is called the centripetal force, and it always points toward the inside of the circle. This force is what keeps the object from moving outwards, because if you think about this object and you think about where the instantaneous velocity is at every given moment, the instantaneous velocity is at the tangent of the circle, which means that if this was a tether ball and it was attached to the center, then if you cut this cord at any second, the ball would keep moving toward the tangent, which is this arrow here. And so you need the centripetal force in order to keep the ball in its orbit. And the centripetal force will always be applied in the direction directly inside the circle. You can calculate the magnitude of the centripetal force by using the equation centripetal force equals the mass of the object times velocity squared, which is the instantaneous velocity at any point, divided by the radius of the circle. Chapter 1.7 is about mechanical equilibrium, and all it really does is give a bunch of examples of when things are at equilibrium. So things are at equilibrium when all of the forces cancel each other out, which means that the object is not accelerating anywhere. And remember that this is for only one object, and so the other things around it might not be at mechanical equilibrium, but the one object you're focused on being at equilibrium has a net force of zero, which means it has an acceleration of zero. And in order to figure out if something is at mechanical equilibrium, if you have a very tricky situation, draw a free body diagram. And I'll show you what that means in the next slide. But basically, just make sure that the forces in every single direction have canceled out 
so there is a, an acceleration of zero. This is basically what a free body diagram looks like. And it's a diagram where you catalog every single force that's applied on this one object. So in this example, I've drawn a 10 kilogram block and it's suspended by a rope. And someone here is pulling it with 10 newtons of force to the right. And we're told that this block is in equilibrium. And what I wanna know is how much force is this question mark rope here exerting and in what direction? So to answer the what direction question, we can see from this picture and just from common sense that it should be going in the upper left direction, but we wanna know the exact angle of which it's at. And we wanna know also the magnitude of this vector. So what we first wanna do is we wanna break down everything into X and Y components because both the X component has to add up to a net force of zero and the Y component as well. So what we have already is that the net X force is going to the right with a force of 10 newtons. And we know that the net Y force is going down with a force of 98 newtons. So what we need is a vector that counteracts both of these forces exactly. To make this a little bit easier to find, we can draw a triangle with the forces that we want. So I know that I want a force moving to the left at 10 newtons, and I want a force moving upwards at 98 newtons to exactly cancel out the forces that I already have. So this forms a vector moving in this direction with question mark magnitude and question mark direction. So with the Pythagorean theorem, we can find that question mark squared is equivalent to 98 newtons squared plus 10 newtons squared. And to find the direction or the angle of question mark, we know that this angle here, tangent theta, is equal to 98 newtons over 10 newtons. And this is due to Sokotoa, where tangent theta equals opposite over adjacent. So 98 newtons is opposite to the angle and 10 newtons is adjacent to the angle. I'm not going to actually solve for the numbers here because it should be fairly straightforward um, just plugging the numbers in, but something that's notable is that this angle here can seem kind of arbitrary because it's being given in terms of the left direction. And in the question, you'll usually be asked to give the angle in terms of a specific direction. So it might ask you to give the angle in terms of the right direction or the down direction and in this case once you know this angle you can add for example 90 to figure out what the angle is in terms of the down direction or you can subtract this angle from 180 to figure out what it is relative to the right direction so don't always take this angle for what it is think about the direction that the question wants you to go in the last topic in this chapter is rotational equilibrium and this is what happens when an object is moving around a fixed point, or when multiple objects are moving around a fixed point. And this is described as rotational motion. So in rotational motion, you have one fixed point, which is called the fulcrum. And the best example that I can think of of rotational motion is a seesaw. So you have this part of the seesaw, which is tethered to the fulcrum, and you have a certain amount of force that's being applied to this board, which is attached to the fulcrum. And this force can be calculated with this equation, where the force applied, or the total force, is known as torque. And torque is the rotational force. So torque equals R, and this means the cross product, which we discussed in the last video, times the force that's applied. So R is the distance between the fulcrum and the point that you're applying force to. And this is just the force you're applying. And this can also be written as R times force times sine theta in order to avoid the cross product and the vector multiplication. And in this case, theta is the angle that is between the lever and the force. And so this is the force and this is the lever. And so in this case, this is at 90 degrees, so sine theta would equal 1. And 
Um, an important topic is, well, how do you find equilibrium here? Because in this particular example, there is no equilibrium because there's only a force that is applied. So I have a question, which is, we have a two kilogram block and where should we place this two kilogram block if we wanted to achieve equilibrium on this particular seesaw? And so in order to figure this out, we can use the equation for torque. So first, we know that the force that's being applied by this one kilogram block is firstly in the downward direction. Because the force is equal to the force of gravity, which is mass times gravity, and in this case, it's one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is just equal to 9.8 newtons. And we want to know where to place this two kilogram block in order to exactly cancel out this force of 9.8 newtons in the downward direction. What we have so far is the force that's applied, but in order to find the torque, we need to multiply the force that has been applied to the radius. But in this case, the radius is one meter, so this would still equal 9.8 newtons of torque. In order to find where we should place the two kilogram block, we apply the same equation, but on the other side. So we want to find where to place the two kilogram block such that it causes 9.8 newtons of force also. And so this would be able equal to radius, which we're trying to find, multiplied by two kilograms times 9.8 9 meters per second squared. So we can solve for this equation to find that radius equals 9.8 newtons over 19.6 newtons, which is equal to 0 0.5 meters. So we would want to place this two kilogram block exactly half as far as the one kilogram block, which makes sense because the equation for torque is the radius times the force. So if the two kilogram block experiences twice as much gravitational force, we would want to put it half as close. Sorry, quick correction. Just to be extra clear with the units, this is 9.8 newtons times meters, which is how these units cancel out to get 0 0.5 meters. So this is the end of chapter one, and thank you so much for watching, and I hope that this video helped you in some way.